This session is about personalization versus optimization. Um, two of the very common buzzwords in uh, our industry right now, and we're going to explore a little bit about what those mean and how they can work together, and, uh, and really how to, to use each of them to its best ability. I am C.A. Clark. I am Vice President with uh, Miles Partnership. I've been with Miles for 18 years. I have worked with all kinds of destinations all over the world, and uh, also hospitality. I did about five years in our hospitality division. So I have some insight there from uh, people who might be your members uh, about how both personalization and optimization can work for them. And I am joined today by... I'm Lucia Sheps, and I've been with Miles about two years. Like CA, I have some diverse experience with DMOs and hospitality clients, so kind of both perspectives there. Um, and where CA is on the UX and optimization side, I am on the personalization side, so figuring out who's coming to our sites and what do they want to see, what can we figure out about them, and how can we kind of mess with their mind to show them what we want them to see. Okay, a little bit about Miles. If you don't uh, know Miles, we have been in business for over 65 years. The company actually started when a hotel concierge started printing up uh, little pamphlets in his garage. And those pamphlets were designed to help people who came to the area decide where to go and what to do. And that is actually the same thing that we do all these years later is help uh, DMOs help people understand where to go and what to do. So we're 100% dedicated to travel. We do have some of those hotel, but most of our business is DMOs. Um, we work with over 100 different destinations. We have about 230 people. Um, these are some of the destinations that, that uh, we work with, some of whom are here today, so thank you for coming, um, and others of which you will notice as we go through the, the rest of the presentation. We have a couple of different examples that we'll pull out. Um, All right, so what we're going to do today, in honor of Friday the 13th, we're going to start with some scary and creepy statistics that you should all be pretty concerned about, but then don't worry, we're going to go through some definitions and some use cases for how we can all work together on the personalization and optimization side of things to get some of those statistics a little better for us. Um, and then we're gonna talk about some conclusions and takeaways and then we really wanna do a Q&A at the end so we can talk to you kind of about what's going on in your organization, how we might be able to um, you know, put some of these practices into practice for your websites. All right, so first one of our creepy, spooky statistics. Only about 22% of businesses are satisfied with their conversion rates. I need like Twilight Zone music in the background or something here. <laughs> uh, for every $92 spent acquiring customers, only $1 is spent converting them. By 2020, customer experience will, be, will overtake price and product as the key brand differentiator. And our final creepy statistic of the day. 60% of marketers struggle to personalize content in real time, but 77% believe that real time personalization is crucial. So the answer to a lot of these problems that you're probably talking about with your, your peers in your organization often is personalization or optimization. But what do both of those words really mean and how can we use them? Should we use them separately? Are they separate? Should they be used together? Are they complementary strategies? That's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start off with personalization. There are a variety of different definitions of personalization out there. It's one of those things everyone's kind of staking a claim and saying what they think it is. There's a lot of other buzzwords associated, targeting, segmentation. You're probably hearing all of these things, and it's a little bit of like word alphabet soup that you're hearing in your organization, I'm sure. So personalization is delivering content based on information about your visitors. So you know, what, uh, how did they come to your site? What are they interested in doing? What have they done before? Uh, what kind of content are they interested in? What kind of experience are they interested in? Things like that. So at the core of that definition is visitor data. Visitor data is absolutely essential to do any type of personalization on your site because you need to know what people are interested in seeing and what they want to do on your site and in your destination. How do we get that customer data? It's very, very difficult to do as a destination. There's not a lot of conversion points on our websites and it's really hard to get information that you would do uh, you know, if you worked for a retail site that you'd be able to get about folks. So um, it's a great example, jcrew.com, any jcrew fans here? To, oh, I, come on, more than that, I'm sure. <laughs> They're all at the other sessions, it's fine. <laughs> all right, so jcrew, uh, you go into a site like jcrew, you put something in your shopping cart, and they immediately know a ton of information about you. They know your size, they know the price point that you're willing to spend on items, they have some uh, 
information about your style. You can see here that you know, I put a uh, black and white dress in my shopping cart here, and I'm immediately given four other suggestions of black and white dresses in the same price point and the same size. They instantly know this information because I have put it in my shopping cart and told them this is what I'm interested in and this is the price point I'm willing to spend. They're even smart enough to know if I change my shopping cart just a little bit and I put a pair of pink shoes in there, they're smart enough to know that they need to realign my suggestions that are offered at the bottom to give me a little flare piece in there so I have a pink dress as well. It's actually really similar to the outfit I'm wearing today, I realize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Retail sites also have an advantage because a lot of times there's a sign-in process. You're creating an account, you're giving them more information about you, you're connecting yourself with an email address so they can follow up and retarget. There's also a checkout process where they're getting a lot of other information about you as well. But on the back end, there's a lot of other information that we're collecting that you don't necessarily need all this front end uh, you know, interaction with the site to get. And this is where DMOs really shine because we are able to get this information. So things like the date and time that people are coming to your site, uh, their referral source, did they come from an advertising campaign, did they come from an article that was in the New York Times, something like that. Uh, the days since their last visit and anything they've done on the site uh, in a previous visit. So if they've clicked on certain elements, they've read certain articles, things like that. And the way that we're able to get this data is personalization tools. There are a lot of great ones out there right now. I've highlighted three that we use at Miles, Acquia, Bound, and Blue Conic. And these tools are able to help us get that data about people and create personalizations based on that information. I'm gonna go through a few examples. If you're in the room, give me a woo if I uh, talk about any of your destinations. First one, visitor location. St. Pete Clearwater in Florida, they have visitors coming from all over the world and they wanted to create a really personalized experience on the homepage where someone who's coming from a drive market or a fly market gets specific information that's valuable to them. So, you know, oh, you're only a direct flight away from our airport or, oh, you know, this is just a three hour drive away from where you're coming from, uh, come over and visit. It's a really, you know, quick day trip. So St. Pete has put together a variety of different homepage header images to target different people in different destinations with content that's relevant to them. So, you know, in this example, in less than three hours, you can take a direct flight to St. Pete Beach. They've also done some cheeky advertising, a uh, little East Coast versus West Coast battle saying, real beaches have sunsets, why don't you come over here from the, from the East Coast of Florida where you don't have that opportunity to see a sunset over the beach. St. Pete has also used colloquialisms uh, relevant to different regions to, again, put their homepage headers and get a little bit more traction and engagement with people from certain places like New York or Chicago, say forget about it to winter, thought that was particularly fun. And a simple change like this has resulted in an extreme increase in click-through rates on that homepage header. So it seems like a really simple thing, but it is really getting a lot of traction with people from different regions when they see content that's relevant to them and information that's really valuable, like how far away the destination is from where they're you know, logging into the site from. Site so browsing history, this is another example we talked about earlier. So if someone has come to your site and they've read certain articles, if they have um, you know, clicked a certain section of the site and expressed an interest in a certain activity, it's a really great way to find out you know, what might be the next best sell for them. Are they interested in boating and fishing? Should we uh, you know, give them a... Uh, direct them to a page about different boating festivals that are happening in the area or something like that. So Discover the Palm Beaches uh, did a really interesting campaign by using site browser history. They tracked what pages and what sections of the site visitors were going to, and then they served supplementary content about those topics on the site during their next page visit. So in this example, someone who has come to the site and browsed wedding information about hosting a wedding in the Palm Beaches was served a banner, uh, sorry, was served a toaster directing them to an article about planning a bachelorette weekend in the area as well. Similar banners and toasters were put together for people who were interested in museums and history and also people who were interested in diving and underwater adventures. So this content typically lives pretty low in the site. It's kind of buried. It's hard to get to. It's not something that's, you know, advertised on the homepage. It's not something that's uh, a navigation item at the top of the screen, but using this method, they were able to get about 3,000 additional impressions on content that's typically buried pretty low to the right people who are already interested in that type of topic. 
Our final example, um, Cincinnati, they have a footer at the bottom of the page with a call to action to um, order their visitor's guide. So you can you know, sign up, get the visitor's guide, you get it in the mail a few weeks later. But if you've already ordered a visitor's guide, that's gonna be completely irrelevant to you. What Cincinnati has done is created a personalization, find people who have already or ordered a visitor's guide, their next visit to the site, their next page that they're on, they're gonna see a, a get trip ideas call to action instead. And they're diving deeper into the content because we know that they've already completed that action. It's no longer relevant to show that to them. So the value here, again, no longer relevant. That's a really great piece of real estate that you wanna be putting an interesting and valuable call to action in. If we didn't change it, it would just be wasted impressions of something that you know folks have already done. All right, so let's switch gears. We'll talk a little bit about optimization. That was the personalization end of things, and so now we'll talk about the other buzzword, optimization, if we're gonna do that very literally. Uh, optimization, and usually when we're talking about this in this industry, we're uh, referring to conversion rate optimization. And that's the, just the process of increasing conversions uh, from something. And that's a really important uh, point here, and I'll come back to this at the end, is sometimes we think about this as being a landing page or a website specific thing, but it's really the optimization uh, can be applied to and should be applied to all of the various marketing tools that we're using, whether that's banners or emails or landing pages or websites or all kinds of different things. Um, the important concept for me for optimization, though, is that the whole process is about understanding why people do certain things and then trying to encourage them to do the things that you want them to do. So there's that twofold uh, process there, and we'll actually look at, a, at a, an example at the end of this that kind of walks through that, right? What are the people, which people are we talking to? What are they doing? How are they behaving? And then how can we encourage them to do the things that we want to do, like sign up for an email, like order a visitor guide, like buy a hotel, any of those other kinds of things. Okay, optimization is a really, uh, uh, conversion rate optimization is a really broad sweeping um, discipline where we, we're kind of touching on different things from all kinds of different circles. So you've got uh, user experience and you have design and you have technology and psychology and neuroscience and all of these other things that are sort of coming together uh, to, in, in to, to doing that job of encouraging the people to do the thing that you want them to do. And that's one of my favorite things about optimization is that it's pulling together a lot of these different types of things so that we're not just siloed into saying I can't solve that from a design perspective uh, or I can't solve that from a technology perspective. What is the point of doing conversion rate optimization? The point is that relatively small changes can, uh, can result in much higher uh, end results. So here's an example where let's just pretend for a second that we have a page or we have a website that has 2,000 people. It's a small number. Okay, there's 2,000 people who come to that. And then if we have a 10% conversion rate on the people who go into a form, doesn't matter what it is, it's to ask, you know, get more information, it's a visitor guide, whatever it is. So 10% conversion rate on that, we have 200 click-throughs that go to that form. On that form, we have a 10% conversion rate on people who actually complete the form. So that nets us at the end 20 form submissions, right? 20 of the, the end goals there from those 2,000. And if we make some relatively small changes to that and we go from 10% to 14%, right, then suddenly we have double the number of outcomes. Same traffic, same 2,000 people on the other end, but now we've doubled our outcome just by making a four point percentage change in those two different conversion metrics. And that's kind of the point of conversion rate optimization is that those very small gains, like the difference between somebody submitting a form and not submitting a form, could be a very small and subtle thing, and it might only change that by 2%, right? But that can result in a very high uh, number of, uh, of the actual goals on the other end of it, okay? That's why we do the, the why conversion optimization uh, is important for all of us. This is, I'm gonna show this one in, uh, again at the end, and I'm not necessarily gonna go through all of the steps of this, but this is sort of what the process looks like. We wanna understand what the business goals are, we want to analyze what we know about it right now. So when we go into whatever, whether this is, again, a campaign, an email uh, campaign, a landing page, whatever it is, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What do we know about what works and what doesn't right now? Uh, we're going to use that to try to put together some ideas. And then out of those ideas, we're going to pull out some hypotheses. And we're going to say, we think these are things that might improve our conversion rate. 
and then we're going to get into the action, which in most cases is going to be some kind of a test. The point of, of this first part, though, is to create an informed hypothesis. So all of the work over here from the business goal, goals, the analyzing, the insight, is all really to create some set of informed hypotheses that, that are, we think these are things that we might try to improve the number of people who do the outcome that we're looking for, right? So how do we do that? That first whole process, how do we come up with those informed hypotheses? And there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can do that. These are some of the examples. We can do a technical analysis. We can do a heuristic analysis, which is really just a fancy way of saying rule of thumb. We can do mouse tracking or sometimes eye tracking. Uh, those, those two things are, are kind of mixed in together to see how people use things, to see where, part, where they are, they're having problems or they're not, be, you know, not following through the, the various funnel steps. We can do a qualitative survey. That's one of the things, right? We, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out why users do this or that or the other thing. And sometimes the simplest thing is just to ask them, why did you do this or do that? Uh, that can be a, a really good way to do that. User testing, similarly, you can take a whole group of users and try to figure out why they're doing something or not doing something um, that is in your uh, conversion funnel there. And then lastly, there's a whole set of kind of neuroscience and psychology, understanding cognitive biases and triggers that are really uh, common to, to pretty much all humans and how we can use those to create some informed hypotheses. So I'll do a couple of different examples here. The, the first one is technical analysis, which isn't nearly as sexy as some of the other stuff that's on this list, but is a really important one. So technical analysis is taking a look at whatever your product is. If it's a website, you want to look at your analytics and you want to see, like, is there a problem using a certain type of browser? Because right there can be a really easy example. If you have, if, if your website or your form is broken in Safari, you're missing a huge section of people right there. Even if it's broken in something that's old that no one cares about anymore, like Internet Explorer 7. Okay, you have to think about how many people are still using that browser, and is that that, that right there sometimes can be like a 10% of your audience that you can fix just by fixing those technical problems. I'll give you one really easy one, though, which is, uh, from a technical analysis perspective, is file size. So particularly for, for those of us, all of us here in the travel business, we're very reliant on images. And images are very large, and that, that contributes to the download time for all of our pages. We know that that's really important, particularly for mobile. right? So a really easy thing to do is take every image on your website and run it through a professional optimizer. And this one, this is an example from uh, Kraken here. There's a bunch of other ones. You just take all your images, dump it into this uh, system, and it crunches them all down as small as it can get them without really any visible change in the images, and then you re-upload them to your website over the top of that. Okay, so that's, I cut one second when I've done this uh, pretty regularly on, on websites just by doing that. Take all the images, crunch them all down, and I can cut a second off my average load time just by trimming out the, the extra size of those images. So that's a, a real easy one uh, that you can do from a, a technical analysis and an optimization. Okay, next we'll, we'll look at mouse tracking analysis. And remember, what we're trying to do is come up with informed hypotheses about what we might want to test. And this is a really good way to do that. Mouse tracking keeps track of how people are moving around on the page. It can keep track of what things are being clicked on. There are systems that will actually do eye tracking. Sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll hear people talk about eye tracking. It requires a, a big apparatus to do that. Um, so it's kind of a much more involved thing, but you can do uh, mouse tracking and behavior tracking really easily. You can do screen recordings, and you can look at those to try to understand what people are looking at, what are they clicking on, what are they doing. And a lot of the times, one of the, the real common ones I see is the big header image. We all have a big, big header image, right? And so sometimes you'll have that big header, header image at the top of the page, and when you look at the clicks, people are clicking on that because they want it to go somewhere. In a lot of cases, it doesn't go anywhere, so there's a real easy opportunity for us to optimize that, to have that uh, click through to something that we want them to take action on. And then just skipping ahead, one of the other examples I'll use here, and this is one of my favorites, is, uh, is psychology and neuroscience and cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are these um, shortcuts that our brains use to make decisions. Okay, and this is an example, this is actually from Wikipedia. There's, I love this chart, it's a fantastic chart. You can go to Wikipedia and you can search cognitive biases and it'll give you this amazing chart and you can dig into all of these different sections, right, and how these things work and they've organized them all in, into the ways that your brain is failing you or, the, or the, the, that your brain is, um, 
is working in each of these different sections. The one that I'll use as an example, though, this is difficult to read. This says anchoring. Okay, so this one is about anchoring, and it's one of the most common ones that you'll see from an optimization perspective, particularly when it gets into retail. Okay, so anchoring is a cognitive bias where, where all of the subsequent information that you look at is based on the first thing that you saw. So the idea is if you go into a store and, and the first thing you see in a store is an $80 t-shirt, by the time you get to the back of the store, a $40 t-shirt seems like a good deal. Right? That's how anchoring works, because everything else that happened after that was based on that first piece of information that you got. And our brains do that. So how do we use that cognitive bias to try to, to encourage people to do what we want them to do? This is a really easy example. I know you've seen it is cross-out pricing. Okay? That's anchoring. Because what I'm telling you there is that this room was $384. Right? It's supposed to be $384, but it's $269 right now. And so you start to do that in your head, even if you know, that's the fascinating thing to me about cognitive biases, you can know what they are, you can know that it's happening to you, you can see it all, but it still affects your decision making process. So this is why, this is one of the ones that you'll see really commonly, is that cross out, because that's anchoring that price and it's saying that room is really worth $500, but today you can get it for $269 or $249, okay? That's anchoring. So again, remember the point of this was to, to understand what we were trying to do, look at our information, and get to the point where we have an informed hypothesis. And we usually have a set of those when we're doing optimization. Right? We say these are all the different things that we think might make a difference, and then we try to prioritize them because we can't always necessarily do them at the same time. Typically when we talk about conversion rate optimization, the next step is going to be to test that. We have those guesses, we have to figure out how to structure that in a way so that we can see whether or not those work. Lots of times that's A-B testing. There's other types of testing. You can do multivariate testing if you have enough traffic to do that. But you can also do other types of testing, like five-second tests. You can make a change, and you can just try to get feedback from, from users. It's almost like a survey. right? Would you rather click on this or click on this? Okay? But most of the time, it's going to be A-B testing. And A-B testing is a statistical approach to understanding which thing works better than the other. Okay? It's, a, it's a scientific more or less, anyway, approach to determining which thing works and which thing doesn't. So we have these here. Okay? This is an example where we have no significant difference between the two. Even though we had more successes in one than in the other, that's statistical noise. There isn't enough difference between those two to actually say that one worked better than the other. What we're looking for is an outcome like at the top, where we have enough of additional successes that we can say that change that we made, that hypothesis, the informed hypothesis that we came up with, was correct and it did improve the actions that we wanted people to take. So I'll give you an example here. These are two different forms. Same, okay, so the same page, the goal was to get people to sign up for this, uh, the, the uh, email, the loyalty program. So we had this page over here was the A, that was the control, and then we said, how can we do a better job of this? And we made this page, and we simplified the form, and we used a lot of these uh, heuristic analysis, right, to say, all right, if we take this out, we have less questions, we move things to the top, those will all improve our conversion rate. And then we ran those side by side in an A-B test to see whether or not we were correct about that. And in this case, we were, okay? The sample two, which is the B there, you can see is the blue box, was more successful than the control. So this picked up, you can see the difference here, we have a range of seven to eight and then eight to 10. So we have a, a point or almost two points, two percentage points increase in the number of people who submitted that form. And as we saw earlier, those two percentage points can make a big difference in the end result of the number of people who did that. Just one more example, these are, are some common ones that, that you'll see from a, an optimization perspective. This is a, called a trust icon here. So we changed the booking widget there, we added this trust icon that said the best rate is guaranteed. Again, that's one of those psychological triggers that helps people to make that decision. And there again, we had a successful result where that B version was, was able to improve the conversion rate of people who are clicking through to the booking engine. Okay, I will just add one more thing here, which is there's some really interesting stuff that's happening in the A-B testing world right now and in conversion optimization where, uh, where we can look beyond those individual, like those clicks. So we can say that people click through on a booking engine or they click through or they added something to their cart, but did they buy? And that's really a, a fascinating um, uh, capability here is that in this one, and I don't have the, the actual view of this, but in this one, the control was winning against the, the, uh, the B. So A was win winning against B. 
right? But if you looked past that into how many people actually purchased, B was doing a better job. B drove more conversions. It actually drove more um, revenue than A did. And so there's some of those interesting things that are happening here where we can look beyond whatever that action is, like a click on a button, and see whether someone took the end result, uh, actually went all the way through to the end result. These are a couple of different examples of tools that, that uh, we have used um, and that you will see commonly for conversion rate optimization. VWO is Visual Website Optimizer. Uh, AB Tasty is a relatively new one. That's where that revenue thing came from. And Optimizely is a really common answer there. Okay. All right, so at this point, we've gotten the definition of personalization, we've gotten the definition of optimization, and we've talked about when both of these strategies are useful. Um, now we're going to get into the part where we talk about why they are so much more useful together. We're doing more than just marketing here. We're really bringing people together. Um, so we're going to go through a few examples of uh, how these two can work together and, and be put into practice. So the thing with personalization, on its own, you know, you're showing people what they want to see and you're engaging them. But it's not really that useful if you're not driving them to complete some sort of action that's beneficial for you. So that's when, combined with optimization, you're kind of connecting that path. So you're showing them something they want to see and using it to drive them to complete a purchase or you know, some, some kind of conversion on your site. And likewise, if you look at optimization on the other end, it sort of ignores how people got there. Right? So we can look at optimization and say, how, are, how can we optimize this, this particular action? But by adding personalization to the front of that, we can do a much better job of trying to get to that conversion. We're not ignoring how they got there. We're not ignoring who they are. And we're targeting exactly the kinds of things that they need, which will help us do a much better job with optimization. So a few simple case studies. Uh, Visit Maryland, they were looking for you know, a timely opportunity to attract people to the destination. Um, and right around the start of baseball season, they realized, hey, Baltimore Orioles, Camden, Camden Yard, Camden Field, I can't remember what it's called, <laughs> Camden Field. Um, great opportunity to get people from certain geographical areas uh, with baseball teams that are playing the Baltimore Orioles. Great opportunity to get them to come down for the weekend, go to the baseball stadium, um, you know, just check out what Maryland has to offer around that timely opportunity. So what they did was they segmented visitors based on location, like we've talked about before, a really simple segmentation. Um, and they created personalized homepage panels related to that uh, location's MLB team uh, and the upcoming series that they have against the Baltimore Orioles. So in this example, um, we're talking to people from Toronto and we're talking about the Blue Jays versus the Orioles come, you know, catch a game, spend the weekend. And the way that we brought optimization is was by a simple A-B test of trying different headlines and subheadlines. And that's inside the, the personalization, right? We can try to target that, the, both the A and the B, and make our decisions about what we're going to do there, knowing that the only people who are going to see that are within that personalization. Similarly, Grand Junction, Colorado, a lot to do there. Oops, sorry about that. Um, there's a lot to do there. You know, there's hiking trails. Uh, there's a great food and wine scene. There's a lot of great music events. Um, so they wanted to target and segment visitors based on the types of activities that they have shown that they're interested in partaking in within the destination. So one great example is that um, you know they have a lot of great events in Grand Junction, Colorado. They wanted to find people that were specifically visiting the event page and consistently looking at different events that are offered in the area and target them with, again, a personalized homepage header. But the question became, and this is where optimization came in, what types of events are they most interested in? Because, you know, events is, there's, there's all sorts of events. There's culinary events, there's uh, outdoor adventure events, there are music festivals. We used optimization to kind of narrow down the folks that are interested in events. What types of events are they most interested in and which ones are getting the most traction? Another interesting example is Visit Savannah. Um, you know, Savannah, obviously, a great spot for leisure travelers, but also really, um, you know, popular spot for weddings, for group travel, um, for all sorts of events and things like that. They have forms on the site where you can, you know, um, submit an RFP to find out more about a group travel experience or hosting an event, much like you all probably do on your sites. And they wanted a way to figure out how to convert that form at a higher rate. So what they needed to do was kind of track people who started filling out the form, either went idle on the page or filled out a few sections and then left and went to another page. We used optimization to 
um, you know, find out where the, where the holes were in the form submission process and catch people before they left the site and remind them that they need to go back, fill out the form, or they can always call for more information if there's something that's confusing that's, them or additional information that they need. That's a really good example of how optimization can play into it. Forms are, are just kind of ripe with opportunities to, to optimize by understanding what things are preventing people from filling out that form, changing what we're asking and how we're asking it or the order that we're asking it can have huge effects on the, the number of people who will complete that form. All right, so let's do a little pretend example here. We're going to not use one of the a destination site. We're actually going to use the miles site as an example. So we're going to pretend that, that we're going to do this process where we're going to marry together the personalization and the optimization and see what that might look like. So let's say we're going to look at the miles site. And we're going to try to figure out a couple of different things. Remember, our, uh, the beginning part of our process here is we want to understand what our business goals are. We want to understand who we're talking to. We want to understand what we want them to do and what they're doing or not doing right now. And then we want to try to develop some, some hypotheses that we can test that combine both the personalization and, and the optimization. Okay? So the first question is what types of visitors are coming? We have lots of different visitors. This is where we can do some of the personalization and try to, to talk to each of these individual groups. We could have prospective clients. We could have employees. We could have industry partners all coming to the same page. And then how do we segment that out and, and personalize that information for them? So that's step one. Step two then is what is it that we're trying to get them to do? And this is surprisingly uh, sometimes a difficult thing to answer for organizations and businesses is to really articulate, that's what I want them to do. I want them to do these things and I want them to do, in this or do them in this order. And in this case, they're different for the different audiences. So we could have case studies maybe as an outcome that we're looking for, or we could have apply for a job, and that's the one that we'll use here as an example is if we had a prospective employee, we would want to show them slightly different information and optimize differently for them to, to apply for the job. Okay? So first thing we want to do, we want to try to figure out what our, uh, our hypotheses are. And so we could use an analysis. We could use uh, click tracking or mouse uh, tracking analysis to try to figure out where are people going on the page? What are they looking at? What are the important parts of the page that we should be switching out and changing to try to make this work better? Okay, so when we do that here, we look at the different things and we say, all right, this is where people are spending most of their time. So we kind of know what we're after here, and then we want to make a list of what those changes are. Right? We could change things out in the hero image. We could change the, that navigation, that call to action button, and have the text be different. We could change the headline. We could change the message underneath the headline. Those are all things that we could change out depending on which audience that we're talking to. So let's say we're going to target those job, the, the job seekers. We could use a personalization technique where we're, we are pulling either from referrer, right? Maybe they came from LinkedIn. Maybe they came from an ad that we placed. Maybe there's some other kind of behavioral trigger that we could use to segment out that audience. And then once we know that, we start to change these things out and see how that works. Okay, so let's pretend that this is someone who came from LinkedIn. They clicked on an ad that we had. They came to the website. We changed that image out in the back, on that header image on the back. Maybe we made some changes to the text that's in there. And then we could do an A-B test there on the, the actual call to action. So instead of saying uh, meet our team, which is what it says on the site right now, maybe we try join our team or see open positions. We could try different types of text in there to see whether or not those drove a higher conversion rate for people who were looking for jobs. Okay? So that's a real simple example of how that process might work together, both targeting and personalizing the information for an audience and then optimizing the outcome, those two things working together in order to improve the, 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 uh, the goals that we're looking for. This is a real simple kind of structure for how you would go about doing this, and that's exactly kind of what we just went through with, with the, the Miles example there. We want to figure out what that audience is, whether those are the different types of audiences. We try to drill down into that audience. We want to define what the goal is for that audience. What is it that we want them to do? What call to action do we want? What steps do we want them to take? We want to research how we're, uh, where we're going to, to put that. We want to construct a journey, right? This is what it looks like when the people do exactly what we want them to do. And then we get into the part where we can build creative. And this is a lot of that. What, a lot of what happens is all of these steps get, get skipped, right? We just we build a new campaign and we just jump right into the creative and say, this is what we're going to do, right? So we have a lot of things we have to do before we can do that creative. We build the creative and then we test it. And then you can kind of continue that optimization cycle of testing and creating new hypotheses and learning from, from each of the steps that you've taken there. OK? 
Okay, that's a real simple uh, structure for how to go about doing this. So, you know, the biggest takeaway that we want you to get is obviously personalization and optimization better when together, but what's the next step? You know, this is not just a website problem. We need to be thinking about personalization and optimization working together on all of our channels, not just the website, as CA mentioned earlier. So a really simple example is something like an email campaign. We need to be thinking about who are we sending this to? You know, how can we segment our email list and how can we use dynamic content and personalization to create different elements inside of an email that are gonna be relevant to our audience? And then a next step, we also wanna make sure that we're tracking who is clicking what within an email when they get to our site so we can extend that experience and make sure that all of our channels are connecting and all of our experiences for that particular person are connected. You use that same process for, for all kinds of things. A banner campaign, a pay-per-click ad, right? These are the same kinds of processes where we don't just want to think about how we're going to segment that or who we're going to personalize for, but we want to think about what that outcome is so that we're making sure that we're doing where we're spending the money uh, up front where we make sure that we're getting what we the most out of it that we can get out of it. Okay, that's it for this section. So if there are any questions, this would be the time. Absolutely. Tweet that. Mr. Adams, how did I know you would have a question? <laughs> how do um, <clears throat> recent concerns about privacy, in particular the GDPR in Europe, affect the ability to uh, undertake this sort of uh, it's certainly when we're talking about uh, foreign submissions and acquiring that information, it, it's definitely going to limit the number of choices that you can make. So whereas before you might have been able to say, I'm not going to ask any of these questions, I'm not going to have a confirmation, right? I'm going to simplify the process, there are certain things now that you really have to collect. You don't have a choice anymore. You have to collect that information. So um, it will, it does certainly change the way that you would go about doing it, but it's also a level playing field is, is, uh, is one of the advantages. So you have to collect that, but so does everyone else. It's not like there's a simpler form somewhere else that doesn't ask those questions and doesn't ask for permission or country or any of those other things. So while it does change it, I don't think it's, it's making anything particularly worse for our industry um, because it's, it's universal across all of the different forms that someone might fill out if we were talking specifically about forms. Other questions? Okay, yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming.